This is the Middle Earth Philosopher. To the casual Tolkien fan, or even a fan of the movie trilogies, and if they happen to know them, the ancient fortresses of Obtuno and Angban from the First Age were just bases of operations from which Morgoth or Melkor, whichever one you happen to choose, was operating from. Or, if they're not that familiar with it, they're just random names that are from the lore that they don't happen to know nor care about. Which is, of course, fine. However, I'm going to go a step further and say that these places were more than just bases of operation or physical locations, but that they were physical manifestations of the main element of the fallen Valar's personality, that being overconfidence, cowardice, and terror. And each particular location has a different focus, which makes them very different from each other. Which, again, if they're just bases of operation or just random names, you wouldn't necessarily think of when it comes to Morgoth. And the reason why I'm saying this is because it is based on different times during his life where they became bases of operation for him. They focus on different parts of his personality that was dominant at that point in time. Um, Two Note was created when Arda was first made, before even Beleriand was created or any formations in Middle-earth were made at that time. Morgoth was still the strongest, if not the strongest, Valar of Lamal. Though, to be honest, I'm not sure if Tukos could take him or if he was equal in power. Sometimes the similarity really makes it seem that way, but take it for what you will. Now, by the time of his first creation, known as Almarin, Morgoth, who I'm just going to call him that instead of Melkor because it's just easier for me that way, had already gone to war with his peers at least once and had been defeated, which allowed for the creation of Elmar in the first place. This primordial world was lit by two massive lamps in its north and south, and it was during this time when the world had been created and the Valar were resting in the center of that world that Morgoth snuck back into the world and set up Obtuno, which was located to the distant north of that particular world so that the light of the lamps could not reach it or at least it wasn't supposed to. That, that part still confuses me, to be honest. That being said, though, this wasn't a typical towering fortress like people would assume to be like Baradur or even Angban itself later on. Rather, the sources say the Obtuno wasn't really a tower, but a pretty much an underground installation for the most part. There's no mention of any physical structures or towers of, or anything of the sort to mark its physical location above ground. And even the name Obtuno, which is Sindarin, means underworld. So all this implies that rather than being some sort of massive physical location that anyone and everyone could see, it was more hidden and was basically led to a entire underworld of installations and hellscapes that lay for anyone who got brought down there. All is being hidden from the light of the lamps and from the Valar as well. So it was from here that Morgoth started to devise his perversions to corrupt the world and make it more of his image, or at least put it under more of his influence. Now, despite the fact that this was a hidden layer of sorts, it was still strong enough to resist the pre-apocalyptic destruction that Morgoth wrought when he took down the two lamps and pretty much wrecked Almarin, thereby taking the first steps of creating the Middle Earth as we know it now. So therefore, it was also from here that he created the first orcs, at least canon-wise. And Uptuno remained this hidden hell until the Valar finally decided to take matters into their own hands and go again to war with him, this time wrecking Uptuno, unearthing most of its foundations, and taking Morgoth back to the far west that they had created for themselves to be imprisoned. There's been debate as to if Obtuno still existed by the time of the Third Age, or at least its ruins, but to my knowledge, there's been no official declaration saying one way or the other. But it would have been thousands and thousands of years ago by that point, so I doubt anyone would have cared, and Morgoth was already gone by that point, so it doesn't really matter. Now, Aimban was said to be an outpost during this time as well. However, when Morgoth returned to Middle-earth many, many ages later, trying to make his escape from the Valar and the Noldor, he decided to make it its new base of operations. This is what everyone knows. 
However, unlike his original bass of Atumno, Morgoth made this bass loud and impressive. It lay at the feet of three massive mountain slash volcanoes, the largest Middle Earth had ever seen, and was later on during the first stage always covered in darkness because of clouds from the volcanoes to protect it from the sunlight. And like Uptuno, Angban was also strong, as everyone knows, having been assailed three times and survived the long siege that the Nordor had it placed under for about 450 years. And also like Uptuno, it too eventually failed to the forces of the West, though its destruction was much, much more thorough than Uptuno was. And there is now nothing that remains of Aimband by the time of the Third Age. So, the differences between these two places is pretty loud to me. Uptuno was designed to be terrifying and hellish, but also secretive. Again, you can describe it as perhaps a gateway to hell, but not hell itself. It was designed to not be located by anybody, and yet strong enough to resist assault if, he w if Morgoth was found. And that fits Morgoth's mentality at that time, being that this was before the latter stages of the first stage, where the Valar had pretty much defeated him in the first round of wars, and that he was very un insecure about his actual strength being able to defeat them, no matter what he actually said. So yes, he was narcissistic, and he was cowardly, yet he was still twisted and sadistic, hence the hellscape that lay underneath. And yet, believe it or not, this was not Aimband. Aimband was rebuilt to announce Morgoth's return to the Middle Earth, as well as his role. He wanted to be known. He wanted to be found. He wanted everyone to know that he was back, he was in charge, and you were going to follow it whether you liked it or not. And this again matches his mentality at that time, that Morgoth perhaps felt more empowered now that he had the Cimmerals, and that perhaps he felt unassailable or invincible because he had struck yet another devastating blow to the Valar by the, again destroying its sources of light in the form of the two trees that left that realm in a state of darkness for quite some time. And if we look at this objectively, it's not like those thoughts were misplaced, because it was quite some time before the Valar did anything, and on top of that, all they did was set up some constellations, create the sun and the moon, but yet did not send an actual pursuit force after him. Also, to keep in mind that Morgoth had witnessed how the Valar were behaving in Valinor, that they pretty much left everything east of Valinor to its own devices, in darkness, because of the wars that had happened there and Morgoth's own corruption of it. So, to his mind, you could argue that it would seem that the Valar didn't really care about Middle-earth in the first place. He can pretty much do what he wanted to do, escape there, and they were just going to leave him alone because they had that track record already. Still, despite its outward, more loud appearance, underneath it was still pretty much the same deal. Terror and corruption. A hellscape that anyone who went down there and for whatever reason managed to come out was not the same person, with the possible exception of Hiran Thalion, who was immortal and apparently had balls of some sort of unknown steel because no one else was doing that. And that essentially is the philosophy of hell in Middle Earth. The Abtuno and Aimban represent Morgoth's two different mentalities during two different times of his life. One, where he felt insecure and had to be more cautious and more secretive to do his narcissistic plans, and the other, where he felt more in control, more empowered, and more invincible to feel like he can do whatever he wanted and get away with it. All the while, his core depravity still remaining the same and never changing. But, as a bonus, what about Baradur? Or for that matter, Minas Ethel? One being a creation of Sauron, and the other being twisted and corrupted by Sauron and later his lieutenant, the Witch King, later on in the Third Age. Certainly, these would call, qualify as representations of hell, would they not? And to that, I would say no. As I had said in another video, Sauron was not Morgoth 2.0, nor did he want to be. Sadistic? Yes. Murderous? Absolutely. 
excessively violent, entirely possible if pushed. But the main difference between him and Morgoth was that he was not a narcissist like his old boss was, and this is reflected in how he treats both of those locations. Whenever Uptuno and Aimbam were attacked and were under threat of falling, Morgoth never left them behind to go somewhere else, but rather hid in its basement and foundations basically. He never left for safety or to go somewhere else to start over again. However, Sauron easily left those places, and in fact was known for, during the Second Age, traveling all across Middle-earth, so it almost could be argued that he was half the time not even there. And therefore, you could say that he also had no real attachment to those places. Yes, the One Ring was forged in Mount Doom. However, it was a neat means to an end, not an extension of Sauron's own personality. Essentially, that any physical place that Sauron was operating out of, he was operating out of practicality, not out of personality. Now, perhaps you feel different. And if you feel that they should be on the list of being descriptions of hell, make your comments below. But otherwise, those are my interpretations of the philosophy of hell as defined by Morgoth during the First Age.